Expanding World in association with the Explorers Club are proud sponsors of this episode of Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher, and the Global Exploration Summit, a pioneering endeavor bringing together the world's leading explorers, sharing cutting-edge technology and innovations to propel us toward the next frontier in the future of exploration and to make a difference in the future of humanity. Visit GlexSummit.com to learn more about the Global Exploration Summit and the impactful men and women who are the heart and soul of scientific innovation and exploration. One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. Greetings to you wherever you are in the world. Today, I'm going to start with a question. What would you do if you saw a tornado or a volcano erupting? Now, common sense would say that you would run. Well, common sense does not apply to our guest today, George Karunas. And fans of the TV show Angry Planet know why. Welcome to Life's Tough. Explorers are tougher. Hi, George. (laughs) Hi, Richard. So what is it that attracts you to things that explode, tear apart, that are big and and angry, angry planet. Yeah, I mean, we live on a very active planet. It's always in a, in a constant state of changing, right? Uh, the atmosphere is always trying to reach equilibrium. We have all these forces beneath our feet deep in the earth, and sometimes they come to the surface in, in in the form of these volcanoes. And we take a lot of that for granted. We're distanced from it most of the time in our climate controlled house and our climate controlled offices and our cars, right? And so we don't get the opportunity to see these grand forces of nature. And these forces of nature become disasters when they affect us in a negative way. And I sort of like that line between natural force and natural disaster. And that's been fascinating to me for years. But I, I think that it's it's not so uncommon among explorers to sort of describe what the attraction to these things. I remember as a kid, now I grew up um, on Long Island, and if there were hurricanes offshore, my father and I would go to the ocean to see the large waves. Or even when I lived in New York City, if there was a snowstorm, I'd ride my bike over the 59th Street Bridge. And, and for just those fleeting moments, I dreamt I was somewhere else. What is it about that attraction to to the elements or nature that sort of floats your boat or other explorers? Yeah, it's it's the power there for sure. Uh, It's surreal if you've ever stood and watched a volcano erupting or had a lightning strike hit really close to you. It's It's an unusual thing. It's very, it's odd and it has the capacity to kill you. Let's, let's not mince words here. These are dangerous forces of nature. So there's always going to be that little bit of adrenaline that's there, the excitement of being there to witness and document these extreme forces of nature and the fact that they, like a big snowstorm can affect millions of people, but a tornado touching down in a field may affect no one. So being there to witness that is kind of special because it's a fleeting moment in history and being able there, being able to, to see that and to document that, to me, it's special. I'm kind of like the opposite of most explorers most explorers, they look at the weather charts to try and find a clearing in the weather when everything is the safest and most likely to succeed at summiting a mountain. I sort of flip that on its head. It's just the way it is, I suppose. George, you grew up in uh, Ottawa in, in Canada, and, and I've been to your hometown. Uh, I was there, uh, I guess, about a year and a half ago. And so it doesn't strike me that they get earthquakes, um, Probably not a lot of tornadoes. I'm not sure what the closest volcano is 
to it, but I'm sure you've actually looked and, and, and figured that one out. So what was your first sort of taste of, of the large? Yeah, it's, it's, it's when you're younger, of course. Uh, I, I grew up just outside of Ottawa on the Quebec side of the river and then moved to Toronto where I, where I am now when I was about 20. And I remember being a kid and falling through the ice on a frozen creek and riding my bike through a hailstorm and swimming in a flooded river, doing really dumb things that we did as free range children in the late 1970s and early 80s, as you do at the time. And that really sparked an interest in science for me and nature. Jacques Cousteau was my hero growing up. And uh, I've, I've met many generations of Cousteaus, which is really an honor to me, uh, especially having that influence as a, as a kid. And for a long time, that was my main thrust in, in my mind. But then you turn 14, everything changes. I got interested in music and spent a lot of years focusing on that. But there was always this call in the back of my mind, like a splinter in your brain that keeps calling you back to what you're originally passionate about. And that was science and nature. And eventually I returned to my roots. Do you, do you remember how that uh, decision was made or how that changed your life? It was a slow process. There wasn't a single day, pardon me, there wasn't a single day or a light bulb event that happened. It was, it was a series of uh, events where I was working a lot, building recording studios. I, I'm trained as an engineer. I used to build some of the biggest recording studios in North America. And as I was doing that, I started getting back into this idea of uh, nature my mother bought me a camera. That was probably the biggest thing. Uh, I had this waterproof camera so I could go out in the rain with it, which was a really big bonus because I couldn't, I couldn't destroy this thing, which was great. And that really was the spark that started this whole avalanche tumbling downhill. And I was able to negotiate extra time off working with my employer at the time so I could go and chase tornadoes in the spring and go to Ethiopia to go to Urta Ale volcano, which I know you've been to uh, in one year. And that was my first ever volcano expedition. And then it just kept getting bigger and bigger until uh, I started appearing on television because it attracted attention from, from the media. It, it, it seems to me that there are two activities that you mentioned that are sort of, I, I think, gateway um, activities to the science. One is photography because uh, extreme uh, weather or extreme uh, events is very photogenic, right? That's always the the prize to, to capture that. And I think back in the days of film cameras, when you had less uh, opportunity to shoot a lot, you really had to be lucky. And I think meteorology, which I, I mentioned, seems to be the other sort of uh, science drug that gets you to look for bigger and better events. So you mentioned tornadoes. I have... Um, I don't think I've ever seen a really big twist or I've seen what's happened as a result of them, certainly seen them on TV, but take me through what it is about those tornadoes that are so hypnotic. Yeah, they're, they're almost like a ghost of wind that is dancing across the landscape that has the capability of destroying everything that it touches. So it seems like something that was written by a science fiction novelist, but yet it's nothing more than moisture and wind shear all working together to create this gigantic rotating storm that can be twice the height of Mount Everest, 60,000 feet in the air. And all of that storm is rotating and concentrating all of its energy on that one point in a farmer's field or hopefully not in a town. And to stand next to that and feel the wind on your face and to hear the roar of a tornado. It's a full body visceral experience. Uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting excited just talking about it because it's been a long time since I've seen one because of the lockdown. Uh, but it really is, it, it gives you the sense that there is something that is much bigger than you. And as you stated, it can be quite photogenic and terrifying. Let's not forget that. So you, I know that you you take people uh, to see them, you know, on, on tours and probably in that uh, hurricane alley in the United States would be the place that you would look. But how do you sort of reconcile, you mentioned on one hand, it's a, a specter of nature that's fantastic. But on the other hand, it's something that if you're on a tour 
and it's just gone through somebody's house or a car or something like that, th there's got to be a part of you that goes from observer to maybe even savior or somebody who, who gets in, involved with that. You can't prevent it. Whether you go or not, it's going to happen one way or another. But what, what happens when it does go through somebody's house or, or, or town? Or, or you, and I'm, I'm assuming you've seen these things. Absolutely. And you've done a really good job of describing the moral dilemma of what it's like to pursue natural disasters is that they affect people in terrible ways quite often. And so there's been many instances where I've been guiding a group and I don't do that anymore, but I spent 12 years guiding tornado chasing groups. And when we come across someone that needs our help, we drop everything and we become first responders. So Everyone on the team has first aid training. There's been many times where we've had to help people out. Truckers flipped on the highway, things like that. I've had to do mountain rescues inside active volcanoes on a few occasions. Uh, it just becomes part of the territory. I try to do dangerous things in as safe a manner as possible. And whenever we come across anyone that needs help, then everything else gets put aside because that's the most important. So volcanoes are, are, are kind of a, a different category in themselves as um, they're destructive, but they're also part of the process that cr created Earth. And you, you mentioned a volcano, um, Erta Ali in Ethiopia. I believe that's, is that the um, longest known one, at least in written history? Uh, I, I believe it's in terms of erupting, it's been for uh, people have written about it for the last couple thousand years, I believe. I'm not sure about the history there, but it's one of the longest persistent lakes of lava in the world, if not the most persistent. I know that uh, Stromboli in Italy has been erupting for over 2,000 years that we know for sure. Uh, so there's, they are, as you mentioned, these forces that are still creating planet Earth. You go to Hawaii and you see lava pouring into the sea. That's making the, the big island even bigger. And the next Hawaiian island, Loihi, is still beneath the waves. And in who knows how many hundreds of thousands of years, it's going to eventually erupt from the surface and create the next Hawaiian island. And that so is really it, fascinating. In Hawaii, you can actually go up to the lava. And I, I used to live on the big island of Hawaii, and it would cross streets, and you literally stand a foot away from it. But then you have other ones like uh, Mount St. Helens, a uh, whole different ball of wax. And I'm, and I'm sure you've been reading about in Iceland, there's all sorts of volcanic activity. What does it mean for people like that growing up uh, with the specter of constant earthquakes and the knowledge that a volcano is going to go off? Because you can't really run too far in Iceland. No, but uh, the people in Iceland are very used to dealing with this kind of situation. And there have been tens of thousands of of earthquakes that have been happening in this one spot in, in Iceland. So we're expecting an eruption at any time, like literally could be happening right now. And it's in an area that is sparsely populated. People are, are they're aware, they know what's going on, but we live around volcanoes because there's a benefit to living around volcanoes. That volcanic soil is very rich. It's great for growing crops like coffee and, and various other things. And so there's a, there's a lot of incentive for civilization to coexist with volcanoes. And that is a very precarious uh, relationship that can be revoked by mother nature at any time with very little warning. So George, let me, because I've always admired your ability for science communication. You and I privately have talked about this. Explorers or storytellers, and there's some really great storytellers we know, but you always seem to rise to the top of the pile when people talk about people who can communicate science well. You always seem to um, come uh, on the short list. In fact, um, you and I actually sit on a, a grant committee together and we pitch the idea of grants to people who are lay people and I always look forward to your descriptions because you seem to take it a notch or two above. How, what is your approach and, and what makes you think that, you know, I, I know you're not gonna say you're an effective person, but you are, but what is the approach that you think that makes you effective? 
Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I try very hard to be a good science communicator because I've spent much of my adult life being a science communicator. When someone puts a camera in your face and tells you to be compelling about a subject, you, you, to be successful, you have to, you have to practice and you have to get good at it. And one of the techniques that I use, two, two techniques, is my own enthusiasm for knowledge and my own personal curiosity. I love to learn about new things and I love to take the audience along on that personal journey with me as I discover. So they're discovering with me hand in hand as we go. And another technique that's really useful is context. If you can explain a complicated scientific process or a scientific idea in a way that someone can understand, then they will be much more likely to latch on to that. So comparison is really important. Uh, for example, when I talk about volcanoes, I talk about how if you were to shrink the earth down to the size of an apple, that crust we live on would be about as thick as the skin. And people can understand that. If you give them a number, they may not know how many kilometers deep it is and this and that, but if you give them that concept that they can see, they can understand in their daily lives, their brain can then relate that to the bigger idea. And that's a really important key that I use. But, uh, you know, I find personally when I watch a lot of um, uh, guys who do shows on volcanoes and on uh, other things, it tends to be a lot about them. And yet you're very involved in the subject, but I feel like you are taking the audience in a way where it's not about you, but you're sort of successfully being a, a vessel for that. So if, you, if I kind of feel like you've taken at least the ego, I know there's ego with anybody, but I certainly think and appreciate the fact that you're able to take people through a volcano and it's not about you beating your chest, but yet sort of being with that person uh, through that experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, thank you again. I appreciate that. It's, I know it's, too many compliments. I, I've got I know, to make you start, <laughs> you know, I, I've got but, to be more like Oprah and make you cry, George. Well, here's the thing. Um, yeah, I do a lot of things that no one has ever done before, like descending down into that, uh, there's a pit of fire in Turkmenistan. Gates of hell. The gates of hell, the Darvaza, the doorway to hell. And I'm the only person that has ever set foot at the bottom of that pit of fire. I was gathering soil samples, looking for extremophile bacteria to give us an idea of where we might want to look for life on other planets. And this was a big science project. I was doing it with National Geographic, had a science grant from them and the whole works and a big TV crew that came along. And I really wanted to reinforce the idea that this was a team effort. Yes, I was the expedition leader, but I had a team of rope riggers and a microbiologist and all these other people that were helping out. And because of that ego that you talked about, we all have it, it's part of being a human being. And there's so many stories about mountain climbers getting close to the summit and the weather is closing in, it's getting late in the day and they continue to push on despite being told by their guides that it's unsafe. It's called summit fever, right? And a lot of climbers die because of summit fever. And I thought it was really important to, to embrace this team idea so that I gave every single member of the team permission to call off that descent into this fire pit at any time for any reason. And that really helped to bolster that whole, that, that team idea. But uh, no one is immune from ego. It's just. Well, I think what you described it. is leadership. And, you know, speaking of, of leadership, we're in, in the middle of a pandemic and uh, just the, the act of going from New York to uh, Canada, it's you can't do it. Right. Uh, so a, a lot of people. But what are you gleaming out of this uh, crisis in terms of how we can apply this to a, a larger picture, the meaning of life, how, how climate change, all, all these big things. What, what, what is the takeaway that uh, makes us come across on the other side in better shape? Well, we're able to learn a lot because of this, this lockdown, right? We've never experienced anything like this in modern times, in, in the digital age. And so seeing the effect on the environment and seeing the effect on our psychology, depression rates, and seeing how the workplace has changed in the past year. There's just so many really interesting things that, are, that have happened. And I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of the papers that are gonna come out of this, uh, this whole pandemic in the next year or two, as we're able to gather all this interesting data 
about the world and about us as a people and a species and society and uh, and this really extraordinary force of nature right because a pandemic is kind of similar to a storm or or a volcano erupting it's this chaotic force of the natural world that is impacting us in in a negative way and so it's uh, really caught my attention in a way that I didn't think it would when it first started. I thought it was just going to be a huge inconvenience, which it has been. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and But um, if there's one thing that we can pull out of this global tragedy, it's that we can learn a lot going forward so that we can deal with the next one so much better. Well, I, I, I think very well said. And I think that the way we do business or the business of life because, uh, you know, there's paradigms that society has, nine to five commute, um, heavy schedules, um, meetings that you might go into for you to Toronto for one meeting that takes three quarters of your day that could be accomplished by teleconferencing, you know, all of those things. I think that um, I'm not sure I'll take it for granted going to a restaurant or God, seeing a friend and giving them a hug. God, I, gosh, I miss that so much. I really do. That's things that I miss. But I, I, I can sort of uh, say as an explorer that you learn to adapt. Uh, that's what we do well, that idea of, of changing direction. And so. That's probably the most important skill to have on an expedition as a teammate is the ability to adapt to ever-changing conditions. Right. If you're too rigid in your way of thinking, if you're not able to bend like the green twig, uh, then you're not going to be as much use. You're going to cause friction on that expedition. So when I'm picking partners and when I'm picking teammates, that's one of the, the uh, characteristics that I look for the most. And you hit the nail on the head with that one. The green, the green twigs. All right, George, because you are a bit of a, a verbal artist um, in, in a good way. I'm going to take you through some natural events in life, you know, like hurricanes, um, tornadoes. And I'm just going to ask you for some association, what it is that you find the compelling thing. Let's start with uh, tornadoes. What, what is the, the association? What do you find compelling about tornadoes? It's the pursuit. It's the chase. Being at the right place at the right time, uh, the navigation, the weather forecasting, being right there where the tornado is touching down is really difficult and it's very rewarding when you're successful. Okay, hurricanes. Hurricane, it's the full body experience for me, the smell of the sea, the sound of the wind, the, the, the feeling of the wind and pieces of debris hitting you in the face for hours and hours and hours. It's an endurance event. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Volcanoes. Visually beautiful, watching a volcano erupt and throwing pieces of lava hundreds of meters through the air is one of the most visually beautiful things I've ever witnessed. And feeling the ground shake beneath your feet so much that your tripod shakes and your photos get blurry. It's, it's like, to me, it's just like being on another planet. Uh, the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, you're Canadian. I'm Canadian, seen the Northern Lights many times. And I think for, for, uh, for, for me, the Northern Lights is, it's a connection with space, really. Um, it really shows us our place within our solar system because these Northern Lights are caused by these rays that are coming from these charged particles coming from the sun interacting with the planet. And I think it's really fascinating and also so beautiful to see in person. I keep coming back to this artistic sort of visual aspect as well right so there's a it's a it's a marriage of art and science on all of these in a lot of ways but i i, th I think you bring up the subject really as i listen to you describe all these as i look around and live in an urbanized area i see a disconnect with people and the outdoors right it's kids nowadays would rather be inside than outside because they want to play these games so is there any advice you get to getting people outdoors. What's the gateway to sort of have people respond to what's their best reality show, what's really going on around them? Yeah, I think it's really important for parents to bring their kids on trips. And even if it's just local, going to the local park and 
watching the local wildlife and watching the sky and trying to understand what's going on in the sky and get them out to dark places away from the city so they can look up and they can see the Milky Way, which most people these days, at least urban people, don't get the opportunity to see our, our place in this wonderful night sky that just goes on and almost, you know, goes out to infinity. And you don't appreciate that because you don't get the chance to see it. We only appreciate what we're exposed to and we only care about the things that we understand and we don't understand them if we're not exposed to them. So it becomes this self-perpetuating circle of curiosity that leads to a life of wonder and, uh, and an appreciation for science and nature. So George, when this pandemic is over and it will be over, is there, what's like number one on your list of things now that you'd like to do in terms of the big adventure? I'm cautiously optimistic that I'm going to be able to travel later this year. And so I've got some potential plans to go down to Antarctica for the total solar eclipse in December. Oh my God. I can't think of a better place to see it because it's funny. I I left out um, Antarctica because when you go there, the scale of things is so massive yet um, having seen a solar eclipse it was one of the, it's it probably the most awesome thing I've seen. However, I felt that the, the last one I saw, I, I could only see it for two minutes. So I felt very pressured to, to soak it in in such a short time that I didn't know if I actually enjoyed it as much as I was there. Yeah, I was, I was in Tennessee for the last one. And I, it was my first ever solar eclipse. And I wasn't sure what to expect. And like you, it was... It was a very busy time. I was live streaming it for the CBC and the Weather Network. So I, I had work to do. But at the same time, it was so much more awe-inspiring and powerful than I expected it to be. It was just so much better than I thought. And it's very rare that we get to experience that emotion of awe. And that's one of the things that I'm always pushing for is to experience those moments of awe where your jaw drops and you feel very small and you're experiencing something that's that's bigger than you, that's bigger than all of us, and it's just it's addictive. It's 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 awe is my drug, really. That's sort of how it works. <laughs> the drug awe. So George, in in the, in these last moments, um, you've seen things that occur on a scale that's so much bigger than us. Does it alter your philosophy of life, or even even what you've thought about the meaning of life? It's hard standing next to a big volcano, throwing debris 30, 40,000 feet into the atmosphere, a tornado, as you mentioned, twice the height of, of Mount Everest, without thinking that, you know, here's this small Canadian guy, or, or I mean, does it, does it humble you, make you feel different, make you optimistic, pessimistic? What is the, the whole sort of upshot of all this? Uh, we're getting deep here. This is awesome. So yeah, absolutely. Be feeling humble is the number one thing that you feel in those situations. You feel really, really small. And when you're dangling on a rope inside a volcanic crater that's 1,200 feet deep, it's deeper than the height of, of the Empire State Building, and there's a lake of lava at the bottom, you feel really, really small. Um, but in another way, it kind of makes me feel big because we have the ability to understand that we're part of this amazing universe that we live in. And we have evolved over millions of years to develop this brain that can perceive that and understand that we're part of the universe. So in a way, we are the universe becoming self-aware of itself. And I think that's a really cool concept. And the fact that we are able to decide what our meaning is in life. No one says you have to be this or you have to be that. You have the ability to decide that. And I think that's a really powerful thing. And so I have decided that my purpose is to travel the world, document the most extreme places, and then share what I've seen with as many people as possible because I feel I have this obligation to, to share this experience and this knowledge because not everyone will get the opportunity to do that. And Let's be honest, not everyone would want those opportunities to go and witness a tornado or be in the eye of a hurricane. So I do it so that others don't have to, but many would love to as well. So 
yeah, it's just makes you feel big and small simultaneously, which is contrarian, but it, to me, it makes sense. No, it, it makes sense to me. And so for your fans of Angry Planet and people who know you, what is it that you, in the end, when you're sort of looking up at that, that final page of your life, what is it that you want people to remember or know about you? Oh, wow. That's great. Um, I, I just want, they, they say you die twice, right? The day that you die and the day that the last person remembers you. And there's a lot of material that I've put out there in the world, so many different television programs and this and that, that that legacy of curiosity, I think is the one thing I really would love for you know, to be remembered for. I want to be the guy who's curious enough to go out there and experience for himself. Think of it like, like a seesaw. You've got fear on one side, you've got curiosity on the other. Fear will push you away from something, whereas curiosity will draw you towards it. And there are sort of two sides of the same coin. If you're excited about something, what happens to you? Your, your palms sweat, your heart starts to race, your breathing gets accelerated. Well, what happens to you when you're afraid? Your palms sweat, your heart starts to beat, right? So all of these uh, physical factors are the same for fear and for love or, or deep curiosity. It's only what happens in your mind that flips the switch one way or the other. And I wanna be known for helping people flip that switch towards curiosity rather than fear. Well, I think, more than just being known for being curious, George, I think if if I were to be a, a bystander saying, what would I, you know, if somehow you left this earth before me, um, and that's possible, uh, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, sooner than later. But to me, it, it's why, I think you're the guy who has really given the gift of why curiosity matters. Instead of just being curious, you, you, you're able to verbalize it. You're a very verbal person but that idea of why we should be curious and why we should love being curious. So on that, George, I, I'd like to thank you for being a guest on Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher. And uh, I, I look forward to, to um, seeing you again and, and seeing you on TV. Uh, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure to share at least a, a little bit of, uh, <laughs> of my world. All right. Thanks.